quite warm. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so today's reading is Hebrews 5, 11, uh, 6 to 8. Um, this is the English Standard Version, and it's entitled Warning Against Apostasy. Okay, so about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For this, for though this is time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, the eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it's impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and had shared the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful for those who sake its cultivation, cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it's worthless and near to being cursed and its end to be burned. Thank you. Thank you for the worship time this morning. That was really good. Thank you for the reading and the prayers as well this morning. Thank you for choosing the Revised Standard Version because it has the word apostasy in it. Yes. <laughs> and um, it's interesting because I'm going to be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, and I actually used that word. Um, but can I just say before I start this morning that I don't know whether, you know, you come along here Sunday by Sunday and sometimes you might be thinking, well, Nick seems to choose uh, just something to talk about each week and they all seem pretty random. We're doing a series on being church. All right. So in other words, what it means to be a group of Christians who meet together collectively like this and to, who function as a family of God. And there is a connection between all of these things. So several weeks ago, um, we were looking at uh, when we had Sophie's baptism, we were looking about not at pizzas, although that was my illustration, but we were looking at these, these four things, the apostles teaching, the breaking of bread, prayer and fellowship and saying how important they are in our growth as a Christian. Yeah. So we're, today we're thinking about how we grow as a Christian. Well, that's important. That's part of the teaching. I'm not going to go over that again. And then uh, two weeks ago, we were looking at how to put on the full armor of God to be uh, equipped and protected as God's people. That's about how we grow as Christians. And so there is a connection all the way through this that, that is happening. And uh, I want us just to you know, sort of hold that in our mind, that these aren't just sort of one-off little talks that I'm doing, but actually there is a whole purpose to them. Now, I wonder when you look at something like this, this picture here, what do these things have in common? Someone doing something practical, Jesus leading a group of men, a little toddler, somebody playing the flute, and a weightlifter. I don't know whether you like watching the uh, Olymp uh, sorry, the Commonwealth Games that have been on recently. They, they we're now into the European Games, but I, I really enjoyed watching it. It was a nice, easy, relaxing way of just uh, having a bit of downtime and that. But there was one thing that really struck me, really struck a chord with me, and it was about 
Katerina Thompson Johnson. Or have I got that around the wrong way? Johnson Thompson, no. Yeah, sorry. Um, and they were, they, the, the, the pundits were there, you know, with Claire Balding talking about her and everything. And she won the gold medal in the um, heptathlon that she was pay, uh, taking part in. And uh, one of them, Jessica Ennis, was there, and uh, she was saying, well, of course, it was 10 years ago when I was taking part in the Olympics in London that this was the young up-and-coming star. And I thought, wow, 10 years. 10 years that that woman has devoted her life to getting to the, be the pinnacle of her sport. And I, you know, I mean, I'll just give that as an example. Now. But one of the things that we know is that if you're going to get good at something, you have got to practice. So what do these things have in common here? Well, to be good at them, a practical trade or anything like that, you have got to practice. I've tried bricklaying. I am not very good because I don't do enough of it, okay? I'm a bit better on walking, because I've done a bit of that, and uh, I've moved beyond the crawling stage and that. I can't play a flute, but I can tell you that Sophie, who plays the clarinet, has practiced and practiced, and has played since, how old were you, Sophie, when you started playing? playing? It's about six, okay, at primary school. Okay, so that is more than 10 years worth of practicing on Sophie's partner. And to be strong as a weightlifter, you don't just walk into lifting weights and think, oh, this is nice and easy and I'll just, you know, do this. You've got to build up to it. You've got to build your muscles up to it. And can I say that just as uh, we grow, um, so there we are, practice equals improvement. Just as uh, we grow physically and we grow mentally because we practice these things, so it is that we grow uh, in our spirituality the more that we practice. Sometimes we tend to think, don't we, that actually, you know, I know I grow physically and sometimes I grow a bit more physically than I want to in the wrong direction and things like that. But, you know, I mean, we do grow in our strength. And the reason I can stand up to you in front of you uh, and, and speak to you is because I've practiced it lots and lots of times. It's something that I've done all my life. The reason that uh, hopefully I can uh, explain things to you is because my mental capacity is reasonably okay. All right? But I know that, you know, those two are, things are important. But I know also that for me to stand up and talk to you about the spiritual things, there's no point in me saying, you've got to do this and me not doing it. You know, I need to practice what I preach as well. And the problem is, is that as we grow older, we can say, well, my body's not as active. It's, it's not at the peak of its, uh, its physical abilities that it once was. I'm no longer the, you know, the strapping young man that I once was. I never was a strapping young man. <laughs> but, you know, we, we feel our age, don't we, is what I'm really saying there. And we say, well, I need to slow down. I don't have the, 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 uh, the energy and the strength levels that I once had there. And to be honest with you, I forget things now more so than when I was younger because of my age. But can I say that there is a difference at this point between mental, physical, and spiritual? And that difference is that you don't get less spiritual the older you get. If you keep practicing, you might not be able to do the things that you once did in a physical capacity in serving God. But there is nothing that can stop us drawing close to God and growing in our faith as we grow older. And the problem is sometimes is that we think, well, uh, you know, if I'm honest, I, I can be a bit like this as a Christian rather than like this. Maybe I can't run as much as I once did. But that's no need, that's not to say that I can't do some of the other things as well. Um, so it, it, it leads us to some hard questions. Why are we not growing both personally and as a church? And uh, I'm not applying this to this church particularly, 
but I'm, you know, I'm applying it to the church in this country. Why is the church at times uh, not growing as much as it is? And, and I know that there are churches that are growing, that they're seeing great things. It was interesting, Helen and I were talking to some friends uh, from the church that Helen used to be a part of. And one of the questions that the man said to us, he said, has your church recovered from um, COVID? In other words, have you, you know, are you back to where you were before the pandemic? And I said, no, we're not. I said, you know, there, there are people that just haven't connected with us again. And he said, yeah, it's the same with us. And I think that's true of a lot of churches. So what are we going to do about this in the, the church in this country? It could be that it's lack of exercise. It could be lack of understanding. And it could be lack of listening and believing. I'll just leave those things for you to think about. Now, the writer of the Hebrews, he was having to address a problem like this. And he was incredibly blunt when he was speaking to the uh, people because he said, you're like a bunch of babies. You know, here you are. You've, you've said you're following Jesus Christ and that, and yet you're still like a little infant drinking milk when you should be on solid food. It's like me inviting you round for Sunday lunch and serving up to you beautiful roast beef, Yorkshire pudding, roast potatoes, cauliflower, carrots, peas, and then lovely gravy. And you saying, oh, thank you, that's really nice, Nick. Can you put it in the blender for me so that you can feed it to me with a spoon? <laughs> That's, that's what it, you know, the, the, the is being implied here in this, in this passage. That the things that they should have grasped, that they should have understood, have, um, you know, they, they're just not getting hold of it yet. And uh, they, they should have grown beyond where they are at the moment. Now, one of the things that... Uh, one of the series of books that I find very helpful. It's called Bible Speaks Today. And there's a whole volume, a whole library of these books. This one happens to be on Hebrews and it's written by a man called Raymond Brown. And he uh, very helpfully identifies three things uh, for this, from this passage that we're looking at today. The problem of ignorance, the problem of immaturity, and the problem of, there's that word, apostasy. We'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. Uh, now, what was the book that you learnt to read on? Any suggestions? Can anyone remember? Pardon? Pardon? Janet, and Janet and John. Anyone else? Janet and John, yes? Dick and Dora, Dick and Dora right? Okay. Zip and Pardon? Zip and, Zip and Wendy. Okay, right? Okay. <laughs> Program. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I didn't read anything apart from the, the instructions. Eight. There we are, right? Okay. Now the point is that, that I, I learned to read using Janet and John, and um, I don't know those of you might remember they were little books and they had pictures of Janet and John on the front, and you know Janet goes and does this, and then John goes and does that, and it's repetitive. That that's the thing. But imagine if I was still reading that book. If I said to you, do you know that I, I found this book when I was five years old, and I still read it, and I love reading it because, and I don't read anything else. You know, you'd be thinking, well. I'm not sure he's the right person to be preaching to us this morning. That there is so much more than just staying with that one thing. Or the pole vaulter in the, in the uh, athletics, you know. Imagine he's, he's given a pole and he's told, you've got to clear that, uh, that bar over there. And so he, he walks up to it and sort of looks up and thinks, well, how do I do that? And somebody shows him how to do it. He says, well, I don't know if I can do it. Unless he actually runs and vaults himself over, he'll never clear that bar. We've, we've got to move on from where we are. So loss of appetite. Let's think about that for a moment. Um, sorry. Lost my place there. All right. Problem of ignorance. Loss of appetite. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we should be. Right. Thank you. So there is this thing, you know, loss of uh, 
the problem of ignorance, loss of appetite, first of all. I can't, I can't be bothered. You know, I've, I've tried, <sighs> nothing seems to work, and I just can't be bothered. <sighs> I'll never clear that, uh, that bar with the pole vaulting, because I, I, I just I can't be bothered to do it. What's the point? All I'm going to do is fall on the, uh, on the cushions the other side. There's no point in doing it. Or the mindset uh, that says, you know, before you start, well, I'm not going to part. I'm not going to jump over that. If we look at verse 14 in our reading today, it says, "Solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil." And the word there that we need to hold on to is uh, trained. In other words, they've, they've trained themselves, they've, they've, they've practiced it. I think you used the word practiced or something like that, didn't you, in the reading? Okay, so that's the first thing. That, you know, ignorance leads to loss of appetite, loss of effectiveness, and loss losing before starting. In other words, giving up before you even start. And it leads to lack of discernment regarding good and evil. And the second problem is the problem of immaturity. Now, I'm not going to read that great long, long list there, uh, because what he's saying there, the writer to the Hebrews, is that he's saying, look, these, these are the basics. These are the foundational things. These are the things that, uh, you know, about the need to repent before God, to have faith in God, to have, uh, having come to faith, to be baptized. These are basic things. And then to be commissioned by the laying on of hands and being filled with the Holy Spirit and teaching you know, how the dead will be raised to life and that one day we shall all face the judgment throne of God. They're the basic things. And it's a bit like this. Now, these are some of the houses that are being built at the back of where we live. Uh, I'm sorry if you can't see it that clear, but these are the foundations of the house. Now imagine if you were told, you know, shown that house and said, this is it. This is where you're going to live. We're not going to bother to build any more than that. We're just going to put the foundations, right? Uh, you can use this area here to prepare your meals. Uh, I suggest you put some beds over here. Maybe you want to put your TV in that corner there. Uh, there's not going to be any walls or any upstairs or anything like that. We're just going to give you the foundations. I don't think any of us would want to move into a house like that, would we? Because we know that a house is much more than the foundations. The foundations are necessary. You can't have a house without foundations. Think of the story that Jesus tells about the uh, parable of the two builders. You need good foundations. But you build on those foundations. And so as we talk about being mature in Christ, what we're saying is that the list that we had that is in verses 1 to 3, they're the foundations that you build upon. They're not the main structure. So, let's think about this for a moment or two. One of the things that really concerns me at the moment, and, and we were absolutely right this morning to be praying for our next Prime Minister, but I'm afraid the bad news is that whoever is chosen as our next Prime Minister will not solve the problems of the world. They might help, hopefully they will help a bit, because if we believe, and this is one of the, it's like a, you know, a, a lie that is, 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 permeates every part of our society, us included, um, that things are going to get better. Those of us who remember the Tony Blair uh, 
um, political campaign when he was ch wanting to be prime minister, uh, and he, and that was one of the songs. You know, things can only get better. Well, yes, they might get a bit better, but they won't get ultimately better, best, because no one human being can do that. And that, that that's not what the Bible teaches. That there is going to come a day when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Read Revelation chapters 21 and 22. And part of our maturity in Christ is understanding that you know, we're part of something much bigger than just this present generation. I really do hope that the new, the new Prime Minister does make a difference. But it won't be an eternal difference, I know that, because I, I'd be going against what the, my Bible teaches me. Whatever financial plan is put into place, whatever um, health plan is put into place, it'll make things a bit better, but it won't solve the whole problem. Because only God can do that. So let's have a look at a third thing, because having gone through these things, the, the writer to the Hebrews, he's saying, look, come on, you guys, you're, you're, you're behaving like babies still. You, sh you know, remember, these are the foundation stuff. Move on before that. And now I'm going to give you a little thing to think about, something really to get your teeth into, something for you to chew over and uh, something for you to have a good discussion about in your discipleship group. There's a hint there for you to have a good discussion about this in your discipleship group. All right. And it's this bit here. He says it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance to their loss. They are crucifying the son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. What that's saying is, if somebody has turned away from God, they cannot come back to God. But hang on a minute, you'll, you'll say to me, hang on, it's not as simple as that, Nick. It's not as easy as that to understand. Because What about that bit in the, in the, 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 the Gospels that Jesus t talks about, where he talks about the prodigal son coming back? How does that fit in with this passage? Ooh, I'm having to think a bit more deeply now, aren't I? I'm having to think a bit more in depth about this. How does it fit in with that? And what does this funny word apostasy mean anyway? Well, uh, Jacqueline said they had to look it up. You're not, you're not the only ones. I looked it up as well, OK? It means an abandonment of one's religious faith, a political party or one's principles or cause, an abandonment of what we, one has professed, a total desertion. That's important, right? A total desertion or departure from one's faith, principles, or party in theology, a total abandonment of the Christian faith. And what we have to uh, understand from this is that this is somebody that has turned their back totally on, uh, on the Christian faith. So we have these questions, you know, how does this fit in? Uh, with the parable of the prodigal son. What about God's grace and mercy? We know God is gracious and we know he's merciful. How do we reconcile it with other verses like 1 Peter 1 verses 4 and 5? It says, an into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. So people would say, well, because it says that in the Bible, this, you know, you're, you're, you're once saved, you're always saved. You cannot go back on uh, what you've done. But then the other side of it, by the way, that's the Reformed or Calvinistic view, the Arminian side of it will take then Jude 21 that says, uh, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of, of our Lord Jesus. In other words, it's your responsibility to make sure that you stay in the faith. So the Arminian viewpoint is, is different. Difficult. 
different to that. So what do we make of a, a passage like this? Because you know, suddenly we've gone from saying, you know, be mature in Christ, and now we're having to think about some deeply theological questions. What happens to that person who turns their back on their faith? This is not something that we can just say, it's not important. It is important, because I'm sure we all know people, people in our own families who have done this. Can I say that the reason I asked uh, Jacqueline to read verses 7 and 8 is because that's where I think the answer is to this. It says, Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But the land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless, worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So we're talking about a field. We've got a field and it's a nice field and it's producing a good crop. Then one year, it doesn't produce a good crop. It produces weeds and the farmer keeps going out there and he keeps weeding the field and keeps you know, digging up the weeds and that and keeps getting rid of the weeds and still they keep growing back again. And it's like the field is fighting the farmer. Everything that he tries to do to help the field be productive and the, 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 the crop to grow well is like it's countered by the weeds growing up and it's like it, the field doesn't want to be a productive field. And I think that is what uh, is, is the clue to the, this passage that we're looking at here. Because if we think of it as somebody who has said... I am going to follow Jesus. They have been baptized. They've gone through that list of things there. But then one day something happens and they turn their back on Jesus. But they don't just turn their back on Jesus. They fight Jesus. They fight the church. They fight other Christians. They fight anyone who says anything about the Christian faith. They are actively trying to turn people away from God. They are there trying to, uh, to dis, you know, diss the whole church thing and everything like that. And then that person drops down dead and they're standing before the throne of God. What happens to that person? And I think that's what the the writer here is, is perhaps hinting at. Now, you may not agree with me on that. It might be that you uh, have the more of a Calvinistic view on this. I think that once a person uh, has turned away from God, that they can actually turn back to God. But I think there will come a day when they, they leave it too late. And that's my own opinion on that. Let me know what you think um, and talk about it because it's important. This is how we grow as a Christian. So just to say, I think that the person who does turn back to God can be saved. But I think the person who leaves it too late can't be saved. Ooh, I've said something there, haven't I? <laughs> Let me know what you think. Because I think there's also a warning for us. And uh, as we come to take the bread and the wine this morning, we, we, we need to recognise that our forgiveness in Jesus Christ is not something to be taken lightly. We see that in part of 1 Corinthians 11, that we, we often don't read that part. And I want to read it to you now. Paul says in uh, verse 27, he says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. 
Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and ill, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. Let's just spend a moment or two reflecting on those words. About not eating or drinking in an unworthy manner. If we have things that we need to confess, let's confess them this morning. Lord Jesus, I come to you this morning recognizing that you died on the cross for me. I recognize that you were punished in my place for all the sins that I have ever committed. I am sorry that I still fail you at times and let you down. And I ask for your continued forgiveness. Thank you for this bread that reminds me of your body, punished and put to death for me. Thank you for this wine that reminds us of your blood poured out for us, that we are washed clean and our sin of our sin are made a new creation in you. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <laughs> 